Hello and welcome to Look at In Your Lifestyle. I'm Chelsea Smith. I'm the clinical dietitian over at BC Stony Point Women's Health in the Complex Lipid Clinic. And today we're going to be talking about dairy. On today's agenda, we're going to go through a quick overview of dairy. We are going to look at the current research. We're going to think about the different nutrition considerations. And lastly, strategies to include dairy and shopping tips. So first, let's define what is in the dairy group. We have cow's milk, yogurt, cheese, and milk alternatives, things like almond milk and soy milk. So dairy is the seventh component of the Mediterranean diet. Our goal is really to include about one serving of dairy or less a day. Um, and some meal tips would be looking for dairy that is lower in fat and sodium, so things like skim milk or low-fat mozzarella cheese, using small amounts of very flavorful cheese just to add flavor, so something like a Parmesan or a feta. We could also think about using unsweetened yogurts um, that'll add some sourness, or we could add some fresh fruit to add some sweetness. And maybe we're gonna try out a plant-based milk. So one serving of dairy is equivalent to one cup or eight fluid ounces of cow's milk or soy milk or another milk alternative. One ounce of cheese, which is about the size of a pencil sharpener or two dice or six fluid ounces or three quarters of a cup of a yogurt. So now looking at the current research on dairy, uh, we are going to look at a 2016 systematic review, which conducted a meta-analysis on 20 observational cohort studies. And this meta-analysis data looked at the high to moderate quality evidence and their conclusions, meaning that we had a a moderate to a very high level of confidence that the results that they were finding were accurate. So first we're going to look at cardiovascular disease outcomes. And this meta-analysis found that there's a moderate to high quality of evidence that consumption of dairy is neutral. So neither reduction of risk or increase in risk for consumption of all dairy, and when we separate out cheese and yogurt. Next, we're going to look at coronary artery disease. And the conclusions drawn were that we have a moderate to high quality level of evidence that consumption of dairy, again, is neutral for coronary artery disease. And this is regardless of its fat content. Next, we'll look at stroke. And this meta-analysis also found a moderate quality of evidence that consumption of dairy is neutral for high-fat dairy, milk and yogurt, or favorable, meaning reduction in risk for consumption of low-fat dairy and cheese. For hypertension, there is a moderate to high quality level of evidence that consumption of dairy, again, is neutral for high fat dairy, cheese, and yogurt, and also favorable, meaning reduction of risk of hypertension with low fat dairy and milk consumption. And now let's look at the current research on metabolic syndromes. This is that collection of disease states like hypertension, high cholesterol levels, high blood sugar levels um, that we see grouped together. And we find that there's a moderate quality of evidence that consumption of dairy is favorable for reducing the risk of metabolic syndrome um, when we look at total dairy and milk. And then lastly, for type 2 diabetes, there is a moderate to high quality level of evidence that consumption of dairy 
where high fat dairy and milk is neutral and favorable, meaning reduction of risk of type 2 diabetes for those with increased intake of low fat dairy, cheese, and yogurt. So the key takeaways from this meta-analysis. There is a high to moderate quality level of evidence that consumption of dairy is either neutral or favorable in reduction of risk um, in terms of cardiovascular related clinical outcomes. And then consumption of low fat dairy is favorable with reduction of the risk of stroke, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. And that is supported by a high to moderate level quality of evidence. We also find that low fat dairy is neutral in terms of coronary artery disease risk. And then lastly, consumption of regular and high fat dairy is neutral in terms of risk for coronary artery disease, stroke, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. So now that we know that milk overall is associated with either reduced risk or neutral level of risk, let's take a deeper dive into milk. So you're going to first look at the macronutrients that are present in milk. So milk in the grocery store is divided out by its fat content, whole, 2%, 1%, and skim. Um, it's going to provide us with the same level of protein, but the fat content does differ. And so whole milk and 2% milk are the higher fat versions of cow's milk. Um, and for that reason, I do try to get folks to focus more on 1% or skim milk because it is very reduced in its fat content or fat free. Now, lastly, all the types of milk have the same amount of carbohydrates, which is lactose, the milk sugar. Um, so th the only thing that changes with the stratification of milk in the grocery store is a different amount of fat present. Now let's look at the micronutrients in milk. I'm going to first talk about probably the most famous micronutrient, calcium. Um, milk is well known for providing a lot of our daily recommended intake of calcium, so about a third of our day's intake. Um, that calcium is important for our bone health, but also muscle and nerve function and maintaining pH in the body. Um, however, there are a lot of other calcium sources outside of dairy. Um, so as we are diversifying our protein sources, so things like tofu and nuts and legumes, um, maybe including some canned fish that has the bones, something like a canned salmon, and maybe trying out a milk alternative will also provide lots of calcium. Next up is vitamin D. Um, calcium and vitamin D a lot of times go together. We will fortify foods with vitamin D to help our bodies to be able to absorb calcium. Um, and that vitamin D plays many roles. Um, one for bone health, but also for our immune system, cell growth, blood pressure, blood sugar. Um, we also can get vitamin D from other sources, so things like fatty fish, eggs, fortified foods. And let's not forget sunlight, because we can synthesize vitamin D when our skin is exposed to sunlight. Um, next in line is vitamin B12. We need B12 for red blood cell production, nerves, energy, DNA, um, and also the conversion of homocysteine to methathione. Um, and that conversion helps to decrease the risk of coronary artery disease, and peripheral vascular disease, and stroke. Now, with B12, we mainly get it through animal products like dairy. We can also get vitamin B12 through fortified foods, and let's not forget nutritional yeast. And next up is going to be potassium. Um, we need potassium for our muscles to contract, for our nerves to work well, for to keep our fluid balance in check. We also know that a diet that's really rich in potassium and low in sodium can help to improve our blood pressure. 
Um, vegetables, fruits, they're going to be the highest in potassium, but dairy is not far behind. Um, so that is probably why we're seeing an association with dairy consumption and reduction of risk in blood pressure. Let's next talk about that milk sugar again. Um, that milk sugar is called lactose. It's a disaccharide, meaning there are two sugars there, glucose and galactose, and they're hooked together. Um, we need lactase, an enzyme that breaks down the lactose, to be able to separate those two sugars so we can go on with digestion. However, there's a lot of the world who don't produce lactase in adulthood. Um, and so with lactose intolerance, that lactose molecule goes through the entire intestinal tract without getting broken down, which causes water to come into the, the bowel, as well as the bacteria to ferment that disaccharide. And so then we'll see lactose intolerance symptoms, things like floating, gas, diarrhea, and it's not comfortable. Um, if we take a look at the map here, the majority of folks who can't digest lactose, you know, they are from Africa, Asia, South America, um, and over here in Greenland. Um, there is a fair amount of the population in the United States, in Europe, in Russia, and Australia um, who do okay with lactose, but still recognizing that um, a lot of the world does not. So a lot of the world doesn't drink milk as a result of that. Um, we can think about milks that have had their lactose molecules already digested by lactase being added to that milk. So that would be something like um, a lactose-free milk. We can also think about using our dairy alternatives if lactose intolerance is a problem. germs hanging out in, in milk. So is non-fat yogurt always the best choice? To be honest, that's a myth. Non-fat yogurt really is only pertaining to the fat content. Um, we can still have a large amount of added sugar present in a non-fat yogurt. So we do want to look for a product that is either plain, sugar-free, or no sugar added. And then we can add our own fruit or a small amount of a natural sweetener in um, that we get to control how much we're using there. So some tips for adding flavor to yogurt. Fresh fruit's always a good go-to. We can sprinkle yogurt with some nuts for crunch and flavor. Or maybe we're gonna add in some cinnamon or vanilla or another flavor extract into a plain yogurt to bump up that flavor. And then after this video, check out the Grab and Go Veggies with Greek Yogurt Dip and the Overnight Oats videos on ways to incorporate that yogurt into other places during your day. So next up, let's talk about cheese. There's a lot of types of cheeses out there. And so this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I wanna really focus in on the saturated fat and sodium contents of cheese. So cheeses tend to have a high saturated fat content. Um, they also can have a very high sodium content. So if we look at our processed cheese here, American cheese, this is one of our highest sodium contents 
and contains five grams of saturated fat per a one ounce serving. Now, if we look at some of our other cheeses that are what we consider a natural based cheese, um, we're gonna see a slightly lower sodium content and some variation in our saturated fat. So it's not a hard cheese like a cheddar cheese, typically is gonna carry four or five or six grams of saturated fat per that one ounce serving, and will run us approximately 200 milligrams of sodium. Now, next in line would be a soft crumbly cheese, something like a feta. We have a lower concentration of saturated fat, four grams per one ounce serving, but things like feta and cojita, they are very salty. And so they do carry a higher sodium content. And then one of our best picks is gonna be a mozzarella cheese made with a skim or partially skim milk. At this point, we have dropped the saturated fat content down to three grams per one ounce serving, and the sodium comes down as well. So with cheese, I want you to think about that as a salt source in your cooking. So we can use small amounts of really flavorful cheeses, something like that feta, a high quality Parmesan, to really maximize the flavor that we're adding to our, our food. You know, I do encourage using really small crumbles or, or small shreds. So we're increasing the surface area that that cheese can spread out on. So we're gonna get a little bit of that flavor in every single bite. And then lastly, I just wanna to touch back on food safety really quickly. Um, soft cheeses like that uh, feta and queso fresco, um, something like a brie or camembert, they can have listeria, which is rare, but it can be deadly. We really encourage choosing cheeses that are pasteurized, especially in our pregnant population as listeria can cause miscarriage and stillbirth um, because there's a higher proportion of soft cheeses in Hispanic culture. Um, Hispanic women are at a greater risk of getting listeria infection, about 24 times more likely than the general population. So please, please, please choose cheeses that are pasteurized. And then lastly, let's talk about our dairy alternatives. So there are a lot of dairy alternative based milks on the market. We have ones that are grain based or cereal based, something like an oat milk or a rice milk, legume based, soy milk would probably be the most popular. We have many options for our nut based milks, almond, walnut, cashew. I'm now seeing some seed based milks as well, like flax milk. And then we also can have um, pseudo grains, quinoa, for example, or amaranth. Um, just depends on your grocery store and what they carry. But really, it's just picking one that you like. So let's take a comparison look at our cow's milk versus some of our milk substitutes. So we're going to come back to our fat free cow's milk as our comparison standard. With our fat free cow's milk, we're not gonna get any fat. That has 13 grams of carbohydrate and nine grams of protein. Um, there is an extra gram of protein and fat-free milk just because there's more room in the bottle because there's no fat there. So there's more protein that can be present. Um, now lactose-free, fat-free milk is gonna look the exact same. We just added the enzyme lactase to that so it breaks down the carbohydrate, um, but it's gonna be the same overall quantity or, or gram weight of carbohydrate there, 13 grams. Now, next let's look at our soy milk. So soy milk does carry some fat. It's what makes it creamy. But that fat content is a very healthy fat profile, very little saturated fat there, only half a gram. Um, it's gonna have about nine grams of carbohydrate. We have eight grams of protein, which is comparable to our cow's milk. Um, and we also get quite a bit of calcium, typically because it's going to be added to that product. Now we look over to the almond milk. We still have some fat present, a little bit less, no saturated fat, which is awesome. 
eight grams of carbs, but only one gram of protein. And so this for me is one thing that I really wanna keep in mind. Almond milk is not a great protein source. Um, as long as we have other protein sources present during the day and at meals, we will be okay. Um, next up is coconut milk. So again, coconut milk is a saturated fat-based product. So it has four and a half grams of total fat, which the majority of that is saturated. So we do want to try to limit our saturated fats. So this makes coconut milk not the best choice. Um, similar amount of carbohydrate, again, not a great source of protein. Um, so really encourage trying to choose some additional types of milk substitutes. And then lastly would be rice-based milk. So this is a grain-based milk, so we do see a higher carbohydrate content. And again, we don't really have much of a protein content. Um, there are certain situations where rice milk might be the preferred milk of choice, um, but that is really a small set of the population. Um, somebody usually on dialysis, for example. So let's just talk for a second about the environmental impacts of producing these types of milks. Um, cows use a lot of resources and they produce a lot of methane gas. So they have a very high proportion of methane emissions. They use a lot of land and they use a lot of water. In comparison to that, if we look at our plant-based milks, already all of them use less land, less water, and have less of an emission and environmental impact. But of our plant-based milk, soy and oat milk um, have the least impact on land use and water use. And compared to almond milk, a slightly more emissions. However, almonds do use more water. But overall, choosing a plant-based milk is going to be superior from an environmental perspective compared to using cow's milk. So let's talk a little bit about how to make some of these milk products at home. Um, you don't have to necessarily buy them pre-made in the store. Making almond milk is really simple. We just soak a cup of raw almonds overnight. Then you drain off that water and rinse in a fresh colander. And you're going to place that into a blender with four cups of water. Then you can add additional flavors such as vanilla or honey, dates or maple syrup for sweetness. And then blending on high speed for at least a minute until it's creamy. And then you just wanna pour that through a strainer, cheesecloth, a nut milk bag, um, and squeeze over a mixing bowl. And then with your strained liquid, you just store that in a, a jar with a lid and that'll keep in the refrigerator for up to a week. And then for cashew cream, which is a great substitute for like a whipped cream um, or heavy whipping cream in like a savory dish, um, can be sweetened and used to dip fruit, etc. We take a cup of raw cashews and again, we're going to soak them overnight. And then we're going to puree those cashews in the food processor with about a half a cup of almond milk. Um, you can use less for a thicker product, use more for a thinner product. And then you can add in additional flavors, um, maple syrup, dates, honey for sweetness, vanilla or cocoa powder, um, again, to be in more of that dessert side of things, or maybe lemon juice um, or more of a savory application. So let's talk a little bit about shopping and ways to include dairy products in a helpful way. So the first thing to note is that dairy products are perishable and they need to be cold. Keep dairy, the dairy products as cold as possible as we are shopping and transporting that home. Um, one tip is just to get your dairy products as one of your last stops in the grocery store. If you have a long commute home, um, put your refrigerated and frozen bags together um, or even using one of those insulated cooler bags 
Um, choosing milk in opaque packaging helps to maintain its vitamin quality. Um, so not getting milk that's in glass jars. And then choose items that have a longer sell-by date. With proper temperature storage in the refrigerator, so under 41 degrees Fahrenheit, items will often last longer than what's on that date um, by up to a week. And then as soon as you get home, put the dairy products into the refrigerator, keeping in mind that the interior of the refrigerator is colder than the door. Um, don't leave dairy products out on the counter. Use what you need and place them back into the refrigerator immediately. And try to store your cheeses in the original wrapping. Um, once they're open, do place them in an airtight container. Um, cheese will have about a one week shelf life after that original packaging is opened. Um, once dairy has been exposed to room temperature for four hours, it really should be discarded. It's been in the temperature danger zone for too long. And then to extend shelf life, milk and soft cheeses can be frozen. So something like a shredded mozzarella, for example. Um, however, your milk will expand while it's freezing. So you do need to make sure that's in a container that allows for extra space for that expansion of the frozen liquid. Then dethaw these guys in the refrigerator slowly until, and shake them up before you're ready to use. Now just for some ideas to include dairy, um, think about using a non-fat Greek yogurt um, for a breakfast parfait with maybe berries, granola, or a whole grain cereal. You could sprinkle a small amount of feta on top of an egg and veggie scramble or frittata. Um, we can use an unsweetened milk alternative to make oatmeal in the morning. I have a lot of folks that I work with that like savory cottage cheese. So use a non-fat cottage cheese with chopped up veggies and sunflower seeds. Um, and then non-fat Greek yogurt substitutes in very nicely for sour cream or mayonnaise. So we could use that for sour cream on a baked potato or maybe as the creamy component in something like a tuna fish salad. And lastly, um, Greek yogurt works great for dips, so things like tzatziki or that ranch dip made earlier or mentioned earlier. Um, and we can dip that with veggies or whole grain crackers. Here's a, some additional references um, that this was based on. So feel free to check those out. Um, thanks for spending time with me today to learn about dairy please check out our other videos.